art of the poem. So let's talk about the science first. We need to make sure that the relevant population, everybody in the relevant population, has an equal and likely chance of getting in the survey. So the number one question you want to ask yourself when you're reading about a survey and methodology of a survey, does everyone have an equal and likely chance of getting in the survey? And what that means is you have to try to reach people at all different times of the day. You have to try to reach everybody within the household, not just the person who answers the door. You have to try to meet, reach people more than once. You don't want to just get people who are always home. You want to get the people that are rarely home as well. So does everyone have an equal and likely chance of getting in the survey? Is the sample big enough? Now this is probably the most counterintuitive part of a survey. Glenn's going to talk about this at length. But let me give you just two um, little keys. First of all, as counterintuitive as it may be, a thousand person sample uh, from my, my home state is Montana, a rural, very unpopulated state in, in the United States. A thousand people out of Montana, which only has 800,000 people in it, and a thousand people out of the entire United States, which has 250 million people, is an equally accurate sample. A thousand people out of Montana and a thousand people out of the entire United States equally accurate if they have been taken uh, in a scientific manner. And the best example I can give you of that is think about it. You make your, think about your absolute favorite soup that your mother always made for you. Your absolute favorite soup. And it's all mixed up. If, if your mom wanted to know, uh, let's say she just made a few that morning. So she only made a little bowl of soup. If you took a spoon full of that soup, and tasted it, that's a sample of that soup. If your mom, let's say the next time your mom is making it for the family reunion, so she made a huge barrel worth of soup, and you want to see if it's good soup, if it's as good as you remembered from that uh, bowl, and you took a spoonful of that soup to taste it, equally accurate. The spoonful of soup out of the cup and the spoonful of the soup out of the barrel, equally accurate. That's the principle of sampling. Now, um, question wording, and again, Glenn's going to talk about this at length, but in general, some principles. You always need to ask general versus specific. You need to be careful about the way questions are wording, and Glenn has some great examples of it, but I'll just give you one uh, from the United States. So they ask the question, uh, do you support cutting wasteful government spending? Guess how many Americans support co cutting wasteful government spending? 86% of Americans. Like, what are you supposed to be? Are you for wasteful government spending? Like, who's for wasteful government spending? But they asked the question, do you support cutting spending? And it was 46% of people who said, I support cutting spending, because it's like, well, what are you planning to cut? Which program are you planning to cut? If it's education, no, I don't support it. If it's the military, maybe I do. If it's food stamps, no, I don't. If it's that Department of Waste, Fraud, and Abuse, I'm all for cutting the Department of Waste, Fraud, and Abuse. Every country would manage their budget by cutting the Department of Waste, Fraud, and Abuse. Order of questions matters a lot. People use the previous questions to provide information for subsequent questions. Also, one of the most important things I can say to you today is you are not normal, okay? You are not normal. By virtue of being here, you are special, but you are not normal. So if you got asked a question you didn't like, you would just insist and insist on giving your real opinion. Real people don't act like that. Real people treat it like a test and they want to get an A on the test. So they want to answer the right way. So the best example I can give you of this was in the United States during the Cold War, when the United States was really uh, fighting the old Soviet Union. They asked a question, they said, do you think that uh, so reporters in Russia should be able to come to the United States and report on anything they want? And Americans said, hell no, not those commie bastards. Uh, we're not letting them in here to report on anything we want. they want. No, absolutely not. Another survey asked the question first, do you think American reporters should be able to go over to the Soviet Union and report on anything they want? 90% of Americans said, absolutely, we get to go over there and report on anything we want. Um, and then they said afterwards, do you think the Soviets should be able to come over here and report on anything they want? And people said, well, damn, I guess we do have to let those commie bastards over here to report on anything they want. 
So people try to be consistent. My friend from Indonesia calls me and says, do you want to vote for the Libertarian or the Green Party? I'm going to stay on that phone saying the Democratic Party until he gives me that category. I don't care what he asks me. I'm not picking the Libertarian or Green Party. That's not normal. You're not normal. Uh, so remember that people... Let me skip ahead a little bit and talk about how do we use polls. So the first thing we use polls about is trying uh, to divide the electorate. If you try to talk to all of Bangladesh, I guarantee your party does not have enough money to do that, no matter how wealthy uh, they are, how great the campaign. We need to target. So first of all, we need to figure out who's our base. Uh, we need to mobilize our base. We need our base to be brand advocates. But if we're still convincing our base, then we're in trouble. If you're convincing, if you're running, let's say you were a, a parliamentarian and you're going to run for president, if you have to convince your mother and your uncle to vote for you, you got a problem. Maybe you should rethink this candidacy. <laughs> um, if you have to convince the people in your neighborhood information to spread out to their friends and family and networks, but you shouldn't be married to someone of the opposite party, I can't even imagine what that's like. It's like, I don't want to say, can you believe what they did? Who wants to argue over breakfast? People pick like-minded people. So if all you ever did was try to get your message from like-minded people, you'd have great message for your base, but not a very personal what you're doing. We did a very interesting research project. How many people... The other thing we could do is we could talk to their base, but that would be a complete waste of time. Uh, so if we uh, spent a lot of time trying to talk to them, uh, in the United States, the last presidential campaign was really targeted two groups of voters, uh, women voters and senior voters. Now, women voters' number one issue was jobs and the economy uh, in the United States. They were very concerned about jobs and the economy. And they weren't interested in global economic policy. They were interested in what we call kitchen table economics. How do I get, how can I afford to provide for my family? How can I get a good paying job? How can I get my hours up? How can I get benefits for this job? How can I guarantee that my kid will have a job? Seniors' number one issue is Social Security and Medicare, our retirement health care and our retirement system. They want to hear about a job. Heck, they were hoping they didn't have to go back to work because Social Security and Medicare were done away with. They wanted to know, what are you going to do to protect Social Security and Medicare? What are you going to do to protect my health care? So we had to develop two messages to those swing groups of voters. Notice I didn't mention young people. Barack Obama actually won because of young people. But they weren't a persuasion audience for him. They were already supportive of him. We had to make sure that they turned out to vote in the 2012 election, but we didn't have to persuade them to be for him. We just had to make sure that they turned out to vote. Uh, in terms of messages, uh, the other thing about messages is really understanding um, what people are saying. So, the number one issue in the United States uh, was, uh, or one of the number one issues right now that is being debated as a policy is tax fairness. Who's paying their fair share of taxes? Now, we ask people, uh, we try to figure out how to talk to people uh, as Democrats about tax fairness because uh, Democrats are always considered, yeah, when we talk about tax fairness, it really means increase your taxes. And people think that's not fair. That's not what I meant. I didn't want you to increase my taxes. I want you to increase the other person's taxes. So, for example, we said to people, uh, what income level would you increase uh, taxes at? And people said, on average, I'd increase taxes on people who make more than $250,000 a year. The other half of the people, we said, well, it's the Democrats in charge. Or they said $100,000 a year, I'm sorry, they said $100,000 a year. We said, uh, we asked them, okay, the Democrats are in charge. Uh, where, do you, where would you set the tax limit? And they said, well, we'd set it at $250,000. We said, why in the world would you set it so much higher? And they said in the polling, because those Democrats, they always come down and get me too. I want to make sure that the tax raise is far enough away from me that they're not coming down to get me too. Uh, in the tax fairness debate, we said we need uh, to increase taxes on uh, corporations. That didn't test very well. People said, who do you mean by corporations? Uh, it tested much better to say we need to, to increase taxes on profitable large corporations. Because people said, great, that's not the small businesses. I think the small businesses are being hurt. I want to support small businesses. But yeah, large profitable corporations are not paying their fair share. 
and they ought to pay their fair share so the rest of us uh, don't have to make up for the difference. Uh, other kinds of messages can be targeted for GOTV. So we have messages to persuade people to vote for you. We also have messages to persuade people to get out to vote. So you know, when we went to look at younger people, we found that there were two messages that really, really resonated with people. One, access to college, affordable access to college, and two, uh, affordable access to birth control and affordable access to birth control, uh, which the Republicans had taken a very, very conservative stand on. Those weren't policies we were going to run to persuade the middle voter. The middle voter was a 50-year-old uh, white, non-college educated woman. She doesn't care about access to college, and she doesn't care about birth control. Uh, she's over those issues. Uh, but to mobilize those younger voters, uh, we needed to talk to them about issues that resonated with them. So how do we think about message development in a poll? A couple of things to remind yourself about the poll. First of all, uh, the average message that you are going to have is 30 seconds, okay? You have 30 seconds to deliver your message, and you can tell voters only three things in 30 seconds. That's the average communication, and that's true across all kinds of countries, across all kinds of cultures. So go home tonight in front of the mirror and try to deliver your party's message in 30 seconds and tell people only three things. That's why you need polling. What are the three things we're going to tell people? What's the most succinct way that we can powerfully communicate this? People always remember stories and narratives and things that are values oriented a lot better than they can remember policies and acronyms and facts. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this was uh, we had a Senate candidate in the United States who said, I want to increase Eisenhower grants. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, who died in the late 50s. And voters were like, okay, she, I love her. She wants to increase Eisenhower grants. And one voter finally said in our focus groups, I love Debbie Stabenow, but why does she want to increase, why does Eisenhower need a grant? I thought he was dead. <laughs> Eisenhower grants are college loans, but people had no idea, real people had no idea what college loans, uh, that Eisenhower grants were college loans. All of our friends knew Eisenhower grants were college loans, but not real people. It, well, they said, well, for heaven's sake, why don't you call it college loans? I had no idea what she was talking about. I think all of us as activists think that facts matter. Okay, well, here's the most disappointing thing I can tell you. Facts don't matter nearly as much as messages, or what we call the frame, the overall way that you talk to people about something. And when the facts don't fit the frame, it's not that people reject the frame, they reject the facts. So in uh, Bangladesh right now, maybe the fact is that the economy is in good shape and inflation is not very bad. That's not the experience that real people have. So you can argue with people, you can have all the economists you want up there, you can argue all the facts you want. When the facts don't fit the frame, people don't reject the frame, they reject the facts. <laughs> so the party that talks to people in ways that they can understand that relate to their experience is going to be the winning party. And then, of course, any message has to be grounded in your own values as well. But what polling helps to do is tell you what's the most effective way to talk about your values. It's got to be authentic to you. But what is the most effective way and to whom? The last thing about polling is elections are choices. And the, the, the last most important thing I can tell you is lots of times campaigns are like blah, 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 vote for me. And we wonder why people are undecided. So the most effective campaigns are the campaigns that set up a choice. And the campaign that determines the choice usually determines victory. Now, real experience influences that choice. But you have to think about it, as you're thinking about a campaign message, what is the contrast here? What is the choice that we're going to say to voters? You can either have A or you can have B. If you want A, vote for us. If you're happy with B, vote for them. Who, what is the contrast that is most effective in getting people to vote for you? It is important uh, to remember that you don't get the stage all to yourself. Remember I said the average campaign, the average voter is blah, 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 vote for me, vote for me. 
Uh, it's not blah, 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 vote for me. Uh, so how does your message hold up in the context of what the opponents are going to say? So you frame the choice as A versus B, but what happens when they attack you on A? Uh, does your message hold up or not? Let me give you an example. We were testing two messages for a candidate, and we tested the message, I'm going to be a governor uh, who's going to fight for women and children of West Virginia, a state in, in the United States. Her other message was, I'm going to take on the special interests and make sure that um, uh, the, the people have the voice, not the special interests. So two different messages, wildly popular, right? Who's against women and children? Who's against taking on special interests for the people? But in fact, women and children was a little bit more popular. It got out more of our supporters. It was a little bit stronger with swing voters who tended to be women. But then we attacked ourselves because we were running with a woman and a liberal and a Democrat. And so our opponents were going to say to us, oh yeah? You think she's for women and children? Well, she's a tax and spend liberal, and if she gets her way, your taxes are going to triple, and that's going to be bad for everyone, including the future of our children. Well, what's the surprise there? The women and children message, which had tested better initially, and we might have run on if we hadn't simulated this campaign, collapsed when we were attacked as a, attacked as a tax and spend liberal. When we ran the special interest message, uh, she's going to take on the special interests and make sure that people have a voice for a change. The tax and spend attack didn't have nearly as much difference. So which message stands up better under attack? A very, very important piece. Not just which message is initially stronger. Last thing I'll say is no message makes, and, and, so you've only got 30 seconds for your message, and you can only say three things, and you've got to have a way to get your message out beyond your immediate circle to those swing voters. No message gets heard unless a message has resources behind it. So obviously one of the things we've got to figure out is how do we get that message out? Whether it's through social media, whether it's through paid campaigns, whether it's through person-to-person -person communication, uh, the important question we have to ask ourselves is how do we get that message out? And polling can be very helpful. Polling can look at what are the ways to communicate to the key swing voters that we want. Uh, who are those swing voters? If we want to target 100% of the voters, we'll be successful in getting none of them. If we need to go to pick up 10% of the undecided vote to win, then who are those 10%? Where are they? How do they live? Where do they get their information? And what message do they find most powerful? So that's how polling applies to campaigns. And the smartest thinking, the smartest policy, the most stubborn um, leader cannot substitute for that, for the real listening to the voters, talking to the voters, and planning out that roadmap for that drive from uh, Dr. to Delhi. Let me stop there and open up to questions and comments. Thank you. Well, I, I can do that after lunch. Yes. I want to stay after the group and lunch. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, uh, Salinda. As we mentioned earlier, so we're going to take a break here. I know, you know, we have so many questions already for Salinda, but we're going to take about one hour lunch break, and then we can come back with Q&A with Salinda. Is that okay? okay. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Lunch is served uh, right now. Thank you. <laughs> Keeping us on schedule, we have actually about five minutes ahead of the agreed time. Uh, so that's good. We have additional five minutes for the, the last session, which is the open QA with all four speakers, which I'm sure everybody's are looking forward to. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the second half of the session is for questions and answers. We have uh, received several questions from the notes, and I would like to Linda. Uh, answer the first questions, and then we're going to open uh, the floor. So, um, oh, thank you. Uh, so, two people ask the same question. This is the hardest question pollsters ever get. Uh, how do you manage if your survey results show something, and the result, election results show something else? And if a survey result goes the opposite to the real result, then how would you explain it or show um, cause to the client? Well, the first thing you do is absolutely have a heart attack. 
uh, and then after you've recovered from the heart attack, you go out and try to figure out why is my why was my pull wrong? Did something happen after I pulled? Was there something wrong in my sample? Was there something wrong in the way I asked the question? Was there a third party candidate who came out of nowhere and uh, really won a lot of the vote? The best example I can give you of exactly this phenomenon is what's going on in the Republican Party right now in the United States. So usually, behind closed doors, pollsters agree. They might disagree about what to do with the numbers, but they agree on the numbers. In this last election in the United States, the Democratic pollsters and the Republican pollsters really disagreed. Uh, honestly, sincerely disagreed about where Barack Obama and Mitt Romney were. And many of us sat down together in quiet, totally confidential meetings and said, what's going on here? And what we realized is that for the first time, we had really different estimates about what, who the population would be, who the voters would be. And there was a variety of opinion about how many young people, how many people of color uh, would show up to vote. And the Republicans had one model, the Democrats had a, a different model. And so after the election, that was part of the evaluation on the Republican side, because it turned out the Democrats were right. In this case, we've certainly been wrong in other cases. And uh, there was really a scrambling. Why was the electorate so different than what we had anticipated? How could we win in this new electorate that has shown up to vote? So we don't really try to explain it. We try to figure out where did we miss it? What happened? Was it a late thing we didn't measure? Uh, were our questions wrong? Were our samples wrong? And because again, if we're wrong more than a couple of times, uh, we're out of work. Uh, so behind closed doors, we're very careful that our polls are accurate. And again, if I tell you you're gonna lose, you may be mad at me, but if I tell you you're gonna win and you lose, I'm fine. Um, the second question is, how important are polls in a country like Bangladesh where political dynasties dominate the whole political process? Well, uh, it's a really, really good question. And uh, the point is, extremely important. And I think my Indonesian colleague, uh, colleague at lunch, we were talking about this. Why uh, is political dynasties dominating? Uh, if one dynasty is going to take over, the other dynasty is going to take over. Uh, being a political dynasty has nothing to do with whether or not you would use political polls. We have dynasties, too, of a sort. The Bush family is a political dynasty in the United States. They use lots of polling. Uh, so uh, we have dynasties, too. But uh, dynasties use polling to win. So what's going on here? And the issue is here, I think, uh, you have strong parties uh, that, and you still have kind of, as, as my colleague from uh, Bangladesh said, a weak and fragile democracy. So that uh, my colleague from Indonesia said it best, I think, at lunch when he said, what we're trying to do is move from parties using money and muscle to parties using message uh, to win. And if you have to appeal to voters, then you have to use uh, polling. Now, we're arguing that appealing to voters is one of the most democratic things one can do. And also, appealing to voters is how you can ensure that you win. Ultimately, money and muscle can be ma matched by money and muscle on the other side. But if you have the best message, you're guaranteed victory. And that's why in most uh, democracies, uh, you're not having the kind of debate after a while that you're having here right now about the power of polling. And then the last question went, it's a very good one that I didn't take time to cover, and I think Glenn is going to cover someone in his remarks. What about a heterogeneous versus a homogeneous population? How does that affect your sample size? So uh, you'll remember that we said uh, 1,000 people uh, out of the entire United States and 1,000 people out of my home state of Montana have exactly the same amount of error attached to it. But let's say I have that survey of the entire United States of America, 1,000 people and I want to go look at the Montanans, because I'm from Montana, I want to look at the Montanans. Well, in a survey of 1,000 people, only one interview will come out of Montana. So I can't go look at Montana. I have to go sample Montana to look at Montana. I can't rely on the national sample uh, to represent Montana. 
And when you're looking at subgroups, men versus women, rural versus <coughs> urban, different constituencies, you have to make sure that the subpopulation size uh, is big enough to look at as well as the overall population size. So the error on a sample of 1,000 is plus or minus 3%. The error on a sample of one is plus or minus 100%. <laughs> so 99 times out of 100, I'm going to be wrong about uh, what Montanans think. Uh, so uh, that you do have to weigh that. The more heterogeneous the population, the more you're going to probably want to break out each of those subgroups. And so the more heterogeneous the population, uh, the more you probably have to do a different survey of that particular population you might be interested in, or what we call an oversample. So if someone said to me, I want to look at the opinion nationwide, but I really, I also want to look at opinion Montana, I might say, okay, uh, we have to go oversample and go get a, a hundred, at least 100 cases in Montana so that we can look at Montana. So let me stop there and open it up to other questions from the audience. Please. Okay. We're going to take three questions from the audience, and then if we have more time, we'll take more questions. Okay. Alicia, now, we do have other, while waiting. Uh, so it's hard to ask questions after lunch, right? <laughs> I think this is uh, something that's in line with what we're doing here in Bangladesh. The question is, what should be the role of youth or young people to ensure democracy in Bangladesh? Maybe you could share experience about how the youth groups, you know, have changed politics in the U.S. Thank you. Yeah, so that is a great question, and it's a it's such a complicated question here because of the involvement of youth in protests and. Um, and different, uh, some very non-democratic participation. Um, in the United States, and in many, many countries, uh, youth have been the voice for change. <coughs> and they've also been the voice for democracy. And certainly in the United States, um, without young people, Barack Obama would never have been elected. In fact, even in this last election, the seniors have always voted against Barack Obama and um, actually voted for his opponents in every single election he's ever run in his lost senior voters. Um, in this last election, he lost voters who were 50 plus, and he won only because of the very high rates of turnout of younger voters. So younger voters uh, can be the real surprise factor. They can bring in a new party. Uh, the Green Party in Germany, for example, been totally brought in by the youth vote. Um, young voters also respond to young candidates. Young voters really like to see candidates of their own generation running, and they often turn out in higher rates when there are younger candidates. And that was one of the things um, that Barack Obama represented. Um, it's Asia will not be president of the United States, but it's hard to remember. He was once he once didn't have a gray hair in his head, and uh, he ran as the new generation of leadership and uh, ran as uh, one of the youngest presidents we have. And so really mobilized voters uh, in that regard. So youth can be a very, very important voice uh, for change. Youth are also very technology oriented, as you know. And so social media can be very democratizing uh, in the sense that you have now a low cost way to communicate with lots of people. And the way the cell phone and uh, uh, is changing our communication. The smartphones are changing our communication. They're also changing polling. I mean, it's you can't do a whole long baseline questionnaire on a cell phone, but increasingly we're doing those tracking surveys, those really short last surveys, last minute surveys. Uh, you can use, uh, and there's lots of new technology to use smartphones, etc., to and have people text uh, in, in terms of their answers uh, during a poll. We have now, in the United States, our company has been polling every demonstration in Washington. So every major demonstration in Washington, 
we've been do doing a poll of all of the people at the demonstration. Now, we haven't said that's how all Americans feel. We've said that's how people at this demonstration feel. And we've done it uh, by text, uh, texting people and asking them the question and then having them text back. Um, so uh, there's a lot of ways in which young people can bring new technology and new voices uh, to the political system as well. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, we have one question from this table. Somebody help with the mic, please. Okay. Uh, one of the things, that, uh, one of the check and balance which uh, bolsters, uh, it shows the credibility of bolsters that if you don't bring out a credible result and it turns out to be wrong in the, in the election, you don't get any more customers. But in the Bangladesh context, there is no customer at all. And there is no Bangladeshi, to my knowledge, credible uh, pollsters at existence. Uh, to start with, how do you make the breakthrough? What would be the way to make a breakthrough? Uh, what would be the right example? How and which area they should focus on to make a breakthrough that people start going to pollsters? To now, be my colleague, because DI has been very involved in that and worked with some very reputable countries, uh, companies that we've used in internationally, some of our international work, not in Bangladesh, but in other countries. So there are some reputable firms who have international rep uh, reputations who are being in, uh, involved in polling. And then I think uh, my Indonesian colleague's um, life story is kind of an example of what happens, uh, which is that uh, new companies can emerge uh, all the time. This can be set up. Uh, but the, the difference is, to get your parties to understand, that what it's, it's valuable to have the accurate polling, not just the polling that flat is your own opinion. Um, my own firm, we started our firm, we, were, we broke off from other firms. And what we wanted to do in our country was we wanted to be a progressive firm. Uh, we're going for progressive candidates, uh, particularly women and people of color. And people said, you can't be a major firm and do that. And we said, well, we want to try. And we also wanted to have internal policies that reflected our beliefs. So we set early on uh, paid paternity and maternity policies. We set uh, a range, uh, a formula for our lowest and our highest salary, including the partners, et cetera. And so we said, we're going to try it. Now, maybe we won't succeed, but we're going to try it. And we broke off from some other very good companies, but we said, we want to try it our way. So you can form companies too, but maybe Dick, I'll let you answer about that there are reputable bolsters here. Yes, I think uh, I second that opinion. We have been working with several, uh, you know, reputable, skillful, you know, uh, companies here in Bangladesh, and I'll be more than happy to share it with you uh, offline. Uh, I would like to add to that questions. I think moderator is allowed to ask questions as well, yes? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, Seeing you looking at your CV, your career, where did you, where did you learn to be a pollster? Is there a special school that Americans go or Europeans <laughs> go, or maybe that's something we should create here in well. yeah. you know, create a public opinion research school or something. So it's a really interesting question, and pollsters from the United States come from all kinds of worlds. Many of them come out of campaigns, um, and then they acquire some of the skills. Usually, at some point in time people go and get professional training, or they learn being trained in a political firm. Myself, I went to school for it. And I actually went to graduate school for it at the University of Michigan. And it was really interesting because one of my colleagues was the, the gentleman that was on the tape in the demo tape from the US government about sampling, so that was kind of cool. Um, and I worked in campaigns, but always, um, but was trained in like sampling and analysis and question wording, et cetera. So it is a skill. You can acquire that skill in a lot of ways. You can acquire it kind of an apprenticeship. You can acquire it in taking some courses, uh, or you can acquire it in, in going to a school for polling, if you will. And in the States, there are a lot of schools for polling. And a lot of those people are training academics, but then many people leave academics or acquire that training or get the master's degree rather than the PhD so that they can come and do polling in a political polling firm. Uh, perhaps, you know, in the interest of time, this will be the last question sure. for uh, selling that session. But again, at the end, we will have one full session for Q&A with all four uh, speakers. 
the question is how can we encourage women in rural areas about democracy, important of you know, public participation, either directly or through history? That's really, really a great question. Let me say one other last thing that occurred to me uh, in terms of your question about polling too, Dickie, and that is that uh, the other place that uses polling a lot is the commercial world. It may not seem like it, but you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken didn't de just develop Curry Crunch because they were imaginative. They developed Curry Crunch because they did market research and found out that you know, if you serve the same kind of fried chicken that you have in the United States, it's not going to taste very good to Bangladeshis. And uh, so uh, the market world has a lot of people that are very, very advanced in polling, and, and sometimes we learn and have those skills come over from the market world. Uh, in terms of rural women, it's a really interesting question, um, and it's a very complicated one, and it's one that we've been involved in working in a number of countries, including in, in Africa, about. So uh, the first thing about uh, rural women or women in general, we were talking about it, uh, I was talking about it with several of, of you all, is that often women uh, take their opinions uh, from their husbands. And you were saying that, yes. And so, and that's a problem, and that was a problem in the United States for a long time. Uh, and in fact, we used to run campaigns where we would send individual mail to women to try to have them form different opinions than their husbands. Now, actually, uh, this was my favorite piece of data. Most recently, we asked in the United States, we asked married men and women, do you usually vote the same way as your husband? And married men, conf or you usually vote the same way as your spouse. Married men confidently said, 73% of married men said, absolutely, I vote the same way as my spouse. 48% of married women said, yeah, I vote the same way as my spouse. Uh, in the United States, we call that the sure honey factor. Sure, I'll vote the same way you're voting, no problem. Uh, it is a secret ballot in the United States, which helps a lot. Uh, but I think you need to have empowerment of women. Uh, we need to organize women that they, uh, they can represent that you know, often politics is like at this level talking about European economy and whatever. It's women who say, you know, how are we going to get clean water? How are we going to get reliable electricity? How are we going to get regional hospitals that actually have doctors who show up? How are we going to make sure uh, that healthcare is provided uh, to follow up uh, when children are born, and not just for the birth, but the first three months that are so critical for survival, etc. And so it's empowering women and saying, only when we have women's voices will we really get those tables, uh, those issues represented. Women also respond to more when they're women politicians. And one of the things we absolutely have to do is get more women to be able to run uh, so that they will represent uh, the views of, of local women. Um, we have a saying in the United States that I will leave you with, and I hope it translates that the women's movement in the United States says, which is, if you're not at the table, then you're frequently on the menu. Um, and that means if you're not sitting there and in power, then you're going to get eaten uh, by, the, by the powers that be. Uh, so if you want your voice represented, you have to be at the table. So thank you all very much, and I look forward to the final session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to continue to our uh, fourth session of the day, uh, and we're going to take a quick one minute break to prepare the presentation. But I would like to draw your attention to the banner in front of us. Uh, this is a result from a survey we did in June 2012. Very encouraging for women candidacy in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah, good point. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to complain, you know. Today's event doesn't do me do me justice, you know, and in this session I have to introduce my big boss. So how do you <laughs> But anyways, I know Glenn by his reputation since, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago when I started this career. He wrote many manuals about you know, using statistical methods to uh, observe elections, to do surveys, and all those things that I'm doing now. So um, I never imagined you know, that 
15 years later, I'll be here influencing him. Uh, so yeah, Glenn Tower. I'm trying to figure out a way to follow that introduction, because uh, I have known Dickie for quite some years. Uh, I had I had intended to deliver a set of points, and I'm kind of thinking I'm going to do something slightly different, but I'll use the slides anyway, just to keep myself somewhat grounded. And the first thing I'm going to do is loosen my tie. <laughs> You all can loosen your ties too. I see so many of them out there. Uh, I'm gonna tell a story. I have been in this business for a long time. I started doing work in democracy development in 1985. And I've traveled the world and been to uh, something like 50 countries. And every time I start on a trip, I'll tell my children, uh, one of whom my youngest son, Patrick, is with me today, with us today. And, and I will tell my children, okay, on this trip I'm going to a country. And they'll say, Dad, haven't you been to that country before? <laughs> yes, I have. Wait a minute, seems to me that you've been to that country a lot of times. Yes, some of them I keep going back to. And then we'll start going through the countries and how many of these countries I have been to year after year after year. And they ask me, oh, wait a minute, you're supposed to be in the business of helping these countries become more democratic and to develop politically, but you keep going back. Have you succeeded any place at all, or is your entire career a failure? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny, but on the other hand, I first came to Bangladesh in 1990. And I came back in 92 and 96 and... 2001 and 2004 and so on and my kids want to know has anything gotten better <laughs> so let's see let's conduct a quick not particularly scientific survey between say 1990 and today how many people think things have gotten better Not bad. How many things have gotten worse? Far fewer. Wow. Wow. How many people think that's a surprising result? It's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know whether things have gotten better or not, but I am very encouraged by the fact that this program that Democracy International is running has been successful beyond what I could have imagined. When I first visited with David and Dickie, uh, oh, perhaps 18 months ago, and they laid out for me the plan that they wanted to undertake with the reg regional offices for women and youth and with the party district conferences with the statistics and other research projects, it seemed to me to be overwhelming and to be well beyond what one could hope for given the political development of Bangladesh. But this has been extraordinarily successful. The engagement of the political parties uh, with DI has been really first rate. And the... Uh, the program of uh, the women and youth centers has worked. The district conferences that the parties have held have been very successful. Uh, our fellows program with young party professionals is growing and will continue to grow over the years. And that all makes me think that maybe 
maybe things have gotten better. Maybe the majority of hands that went up are correct and that things are getting better or at least getting more vibrant. So I want to tell a little story, another story. You had people suggest to you that public opinion research was important in a vibrant democracy. Now, I, I can't tell you what country this story is about, but it's close by. It's not exactly touches, doesn't touch Bangladesh, but there's only one country in between. Um, and you, you all used to be very close. Uh, but in this particular country, they, um, and the, the date would be 2007, I was training civil society groups in how to better advocate for political freedom. And we went to a retreat up in there, I don't want to tell you what mountains, but they're tall. Um, and one of them is called K2. Um, but that's not where we were. Um, so we're up in the, this mountain retreat, and there were civil society leaders there from perhaps 100 civil society organizations. And I spent one week with them. Those of you who know me are right now really surprised that I spent a week anyplace. Uh, but I was there for a whole week. And during that time, we talked about the president of this country. And I asked, what do you think of the president? He said, he's fine. Seems like a good man to us. We've had prosperity. Our relationships with neighboring countries have gotten better. The insurrectionist movement in the country has diminished. The military has stayed in the barracks. I said, so you don't have any complaints about your president at all? None. And for a week. We would sit uh, in the evening, and, and we wouldn't drink, of course, but um, we would drink tea, and we would talk about the leader of their country. Couldn't get anyone to say a bad word about him. In the middle of the conference, an opinion survey came out, and the survey was sponsored by an American organization that does this kind of work, who's they had done quite a bit of survey work in this country. And the survey said that the leader of this country was extraordinarily unpopular. <laughs> Everybody hated the man. He didn't have a friend even among his relatives. And that there was no way in the world that when there was a general election was held, that his party could possibly win a general election. And if it did, then that meant there had to be cheating. So I said, well, that's pretty strong words. And that night, we sat around, and I asked people, well, what do you think now? And <coughs> some of them said, well, you know, maybe he's not as good as we thought he was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, why would that be? So, well, because all my fellow countrymen from this public opinion research study, they say the guy's terrible. So maybe I just didn't know. Poll comes out a month later from the same organization. The president had been here, now he's, you know, down here somewhere. His, his popularity, which was terrible to begin with, has gotten even worse. Then another organization comes out with an analytical study, not based on quantitative research, but rather based on their view of the society and politics. And they said, if the president's party gets reelected in the general election, that this will prove that the elections commission cheated and there should be violence in the streets. This came from an international organization reputed to be responsible. Well, we, um, we went on to watch uh, this president's party uh, roundly defeated in the elections. 
And I hold the view today, many disagree with me, but I feel that those surveys destroyed that person's presidency. That there was not, I mean, he had problems, okay? Every leader has problems. There are things that this president did that were not reasonable, and he got into fights with the judiciary that he probably should not have. But he didn't go from nobody thinking he was all that bad to everybody thinking he was terrible over a period of three months just because. And he didn't do that much during that period. It was very different from what he had done previously. But what happened was a, what we call a snowball effect, a little bit of snow starts at the top of the hill and starts to come down the hill and picks up more snow and more snow and pretty soon you have an avalanche. And th that's one of the things that happened to him. And I tell that story because public opinion research is a weapon. It's not just information, but it is something that you can beat people with, both physically and technically. And what I was going to talk about was how complicated opinion research is and how there are things that you can learn about opinion research that will enable you to better understand it and use it better. And I'm thinking now that I'm going to go through these slides and make the same points, but I'm thinking about it differently. I'm thinking that what you need to take away from this, or what I would suggest to you that you take away from this, is how complicated statistics and opinion research really are. This is a field I met earlier today, uh, uh, Dr. Mola, who's the uh, chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Dhaka. Now, this gentleman has a doctorate degree in political science, and I am certain that much of what he studied was how to use statistics to better understand how politics functions. There is no way in the world that most of you will ever come to his level of understanding of how opinion research works. And you don't have to. What you need to be able to do is to understand what questions to ask and to be able to identify experts from your own organization, your own party, your own civil society group, from whatever. But you can identify people who you can trust that if you ask the right questions, you will get from them the answers that help you decide whether or not the research that you're using is accurate. And whether or not it tells you what you really need to know in order to use it as a weapon against your political opponents. Because there is no point in doing opinion research if you're not going to use it for something. You all aren't just inquisitive. You're not just sort of interested in what people may think. You're engaged actively in politics, and politics is a form of warfare. Hopefully, hopefully, a non-aggressive form of warfare, or one which is not bloody, but it is warfare nevertheless. Because you are trying to beat your opponent. You are trying to take from them the power that they have and take that power for yourself so that you can govern the country in the way you think most appropriate. Because you have policies and ideas and plans and would like to see the country progress in a different way than those who currently hold power. After all, if you wanted it to progress the same way, you wouldn't object to their being in power. So there must be some kind of difference. So let's take a look at these slides and let me see if I can remember what's up there and why. <laughs> Hopefully from this distance I'll be able to see them. Am I supposed to see them there? 
All I can see there is me, and I don't like the look of him. Okay. Let's start with something that's really simple. Everybody talks about margin of error, which is how it's a measure of how accurate the survey is. And people use the term and throw it around. Yes, the margin of error was 5%. And I didn't write it up there, but I might say 5% at what level of confidence? And you say, hmm, level of confidence. I've not heard that before. Well, interestingly, margins of error are not simply a measure of how accurate the survey is, but there's another measure, which is how often is it that accurate? So for example, I asked a thousand people a question. Margin of error is about three percentage points at the 95% confidence interval, which means that if I t ask the same question again to another thousand people chosen the same way, that 95% of the time, the margin of error would be three percentage points plus or minus. 95% of the time. But, but 5% of the time, the margin of error is going to be more than three percentage points. It might be four. It could be 20. You say to yourself, well, like, how could it be 20? Well, if I take a coin and flip it a hundred times, do your coins have heads and tails? Do you even have coins? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you flip a coin a hundred times, you should get 50 heads and 50 tails. And if you do it frequently enough, if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, the more you do it, the more likely it is that it'll be 50-50. But there could come a time when you flip it and have 150 heads in a row show up. Seems impossible. You all know the number pi? Not the movie, the number. It's a mathematical expression, which is the relationship between the diameter of a circle and its circumference. It starts at 2.1417, and it goes on endlessly and never repeats. There's a service you can call up on the internet and say to them, I would like to know at what point in calculating the number pi, my birthday first shows up? <laughs> and they'll tell you, oh yeah, your birthday shows up at point 10,222 through 10,226. So you say, wow, that's amazing. In calculating the value of pi, my birthday shows up. And then you can call them and say, okay, I want to know the first time that the number nine shows up 12 times in a row. Oh, and they'll tell you, oh yeah, that's at number 2,348,264 through 276. Wow. Any, anything you can possibly imagine in terms of a number string shows up in an endless calculation for the value of pi. And they've been calculating the value of pi now out to <coughs> billions and billions of places. And it has never become a repeating decimal. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to decide if it eventually it becomes a rational number. But if you think about it, that means that anything that involves random choice is possible at some point. So when you hear that there is a survey with a 5% margin of error, all that tells you is that at some level of confidence, 95% is typically used, sometimes 99, that if you did the same thing again, you'd get the same response. The statistics behind polling does not say that because I asked a thousand people something, that everybody that's part of the larger group from which the thousand came, that everybody thinks the same way. What it actually says is if I ask another thousand people chosen the same way, and I ask them the same questions in the same way, that within that margin of error, 95 times out of 100, they would say the same thing. 
Now that's very different when you think about it than saying that that means the people all would think that way. Let's, let's just take a look at margin of errors. This, it's the, one of the simplest calculations. There, there it is right there. That's pretty simple, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> but if, that's, if, you, if you can't do that, then there's another way of doing it. You could do this. It's just simple. I mean, yeah, everybody can do this, I'm sure. Um, nothing to it. We'll get to that in a minute. Get back up. I learned it. Cheap trick the other day for calculating margin of error. I've never heard this before. And this is really interesting, and it's worth keeping just kind of back there. You take the sample size, whatever number it is. Let's say in this case that the sample size is 1,600, 1,600 people. You take the square root of the sample size, square root. You used to have to have a slide rule. You used to have to have to know the formula. Now you got to own a phone. <laughs> if you own a phone, you can get the square root of any number you want. Most, you know, got an app or whatever. So you take the square root of the number. What's the square root of 1600? 40. 40. Okay. Divide the square root of the sample size into 100. What's 100 divided by 40? 2.5. Therefore, a sample size of 1,600 generates a margin of error of about 2.5 at 95% confidence. Quick, dirty, easy. It's not exactly 2.5. It's probably more like 2.47 or 2.51, whatever it is. But for your purposes, when you're having your conversation with the pollster or whoever it is, and they suggest to you that you need a sample size of some certain level, in order to get accuracy of a certain type, you can now quickly figure in your head, or with your telephone, what that margin of error is. And when the pollster then says to you it's something else, you immediately put your hand up and say, well, I, let me ask. Now what's the point of margin of error? The point is so you know how accurate the information is. But accuracy is only important to the extent you can use the information. So, if I'm growing rice, and my choice is between three different types of rice I can buy, and I know how much the seed is, and I can play it one of three different types, and I really want to know which is going to be best. So what I do ahead of time is I plant just a few hectares of each type of rice, and then I measure which does better, and I make my decision and I can use statistics to help me. Well, when you're dealing with rice, doing two or three percent better is a huge difference. That might make the difference between it being economic or not. To use one rice over the other it means you might make money, you might not, within a very small margin. So being accurate is really important. Now let's look at politics. I want to know whether or not people think my new policy on import substitution, uh, which is producing things here and having high duty to prevent things from being brought from other countries. That's a common policy, a mistaken one, but it's used. So we don't want cars brought into the country. We'd rather make them here and we'll charge high duty. And he asked people, what do you think? And he get back that by a figure of 44 to 32 people do not like import substitution policies. What are you going to do with that? It's not operational. It's not a piece of information that you can do something with. So one of the first things to remember is only get information that's useful. Let's go back to this, uh, this battle analogy for a moment, the political battle here. If you're in a real war and you're trying to fight, uh, you know, a major army, and someone comes to you and says, 